I guess it's time to, if it's getting so quiet, I guess it's time to start. Please, nobody walk up and slap me. I just want to. <laughs> just go ahead and get that out of the way. <laughs> yeah, I saw some somebody a joke that uh, a meme or something is, is like, uh, as if they were Kanye West. I was like, man, I wouldn't have done that. And here, you know, if you remember his microphone grabbing. <laughs> wow, that's good. Well, good morning. Um, I am very excited about this class. And if you hadn't. Uh, hadn't been with us in the last couple of weeks, we are going to design a 25-year-old Christian adult. And I know we have a lot of uh, people on spring break coming up, uh, but uh, thankful to YouTube that we can share this information with you. Um, I like to design things, I like to build things, create things, uh, and yet when you think about designing an adult, that sounds like just kind of a weird kind of uh, concept. But I think from a biblical standpoint, uh, there is some wisdom in a design process or thought uh, when it comes to how we raise our children. Uh, it also uh, can even translate into how we influence our grandchildren, uh, but also uh, the church being a family, uh, a team, so to speak, Really, it's our responsibility to help one another's children become successful and uh, biblical Christian adults uh, when they get to that age. So I wanted to set a couple ground rules. Maybe you've been in some, uh, uh, what do you call those, brainstorming events at work. And one of the rules, uh, often, is there are no stupid ideas. That is actually false. There are so many stupid <laughs> ideas. You know, if, if you have a reservoir and say, you know, it, we're evaporation and we're losing the, the level, let's just throw in a bunch of bowling balls and that'll keep the level high. Well, that's, that's ridiculous. Uh, but I did see some information where somebody did use a ball, a black plastic floating ball, and they just covered a reservoir with those and it actually worked. So bowling balls, not a good idea. Floating balls, yes, excellent idea. So sometimes bad ideas spin, uh, spin into good ideas. So here's a couple uh, ground rules I thought I'd throw out. Number one, there are no perfect children. Uh, that is just not going to happen. Uh, there are plenty of perfect grandchildren, depends on who you uh, are talking to, at least, at least for a short while, until they can walk and talk and then it gets out of hand. Uh, number two, there are no perfect parents. No matter how skilled you are, no matter how well your parents raised you, they were not perfect and you will not be perfect as well. This class might, might get a little emotional. Um, and that's fine, because parenting is tough work. And uh, we're here to support each other, and I encourage that uh, we be here for one another. Um, the other day, not too long ago, a couple weeks ago, um, uh, Stan had brought up the most quoted scripture in the world. Do you remember what that was? And it's not John 3.16. John says not lest he should judge. Right. Do you know where that is? <clears throat> Matthew. Let's turn to Matthew. Very good. Five or six. Matthew chapter 7. Who can read that? Verse 1 through 3. Verse says 1 through 3. Whoever's got that verse. Judge not that you be not judged. For with that judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? So I think it's a great uh, verse because, again, we all have different parenting experiences. Um, some people who were in this class that just aren't today uh, don't even have children yet. But it's so easy to look at another family situation and say, Boy, I think I would have handled that differently. You don't know. You're not in their shoes. 
Uh, per perhaps they are already doing things better than you might do. Uh, so I think this is a good verse to keep in mind, and certainly gossip is, is way out. Uh, we're commanded not to do that. We're here to build each other up, not to uh, uh, tear each other down. Uh, I do think it's uh, very helpful that uh, as we look back on our parenting uh, experience up to this point, that to share one's successes and to share one's mistakes can be so educational uh, and so beneficial for everyone else. We can all ask the question, what would I do differently? And there are plenty of examples that I know uh, that I would do things differently or I would handle situations differently or perhaps my demeanor might have been better in certain cases. Uh, but there are other times where you thought, you know what, I nailed that. <laughs> you know, man, I was an extra good parent that day. As hard as that was, the effect or the result of my parenting technique worked as expected, hoped, or as the Bible uh, commands. So, uh, if there's, you know, Solomon, wisest man in the world, made some huge mistakes. As a result of studying Solomon, I have limited myself to one wife only. Okay? <laughs> there are, all right, the United States doesn't allow me to have more. But I think even if we could, we can learn from some of these mistakes and how uh, there are uh, good decisions and bad decisions. Proverbs 22.6, turn to that. Does anybody know off the top of your head what Proverbs 22.6? Proverbs. Whoever has that. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. So what can we glean from this verse? There's two points in particular that jump out at me. There may be more, but what is it? We should for? train our children in the Lord. We should train our... So it sounds like a commandment, does it not? Yes. It's not a subtle suggestion. Hey, you might want to think about you know, training up your child. Uh, it is a commandment. What else can we glean? There's also a promise in there. How so? It says, and when he is old, there, there's like a result after that. And when he is old, he will not depart. So, so there is a result, a uh, it's an expectation. Like, right. It's kind of like the one with the uh, children obey your parents and old for this right, you know. And then it says it gives the reasoning, say, hey, you'll live long on the earth. Right. So. So there's a cause and effect, a benefit. <laughs> Ken, where are you going? About to say something. I was going to say train implies that there's some kind of regimen. There's, it's not just, you know, it just doesn't happen. Why. It's not a random yeah, it's not type a, of thing. Not there's a forethought. Uh, yeah, very good point. Um, so it's a commandment. There is an expectation of uh, order or uh, some type of method, technique of which you, you don't just randomly uh, uh, take different topics and throw them at your kid, they may not be ready for certain topics. You know, Jake is a math teacher. You don't start with calculus. You start with one plus one equals two. Uh, and you build on it, it doesn't. You start with counting. <laughs> All right, you before that, yeah. You gotta know your numbers, right? Uh, so uh, there is a order of which we are to, to do things. Um, but there's one thing that I think that's kind of, any other comments? There's one thing that's, I think, maybe a hidden lesson. So, uh, kind of what he was saying, it's not just, um, it's got to be a consistent action. It can't be just a one-time teaching. Um, right. I hate to use the analogy, when you train a dog, you don't tell it to sit when the first time it sits, you expect, okay, we're good. It's, yeah. it's constant. Yeah. You constantly have to, to work at it. Right. That's, that's a good uh, analogy, I like that. Um, if you were to tell your dog how to sit once uh, and then stop there, how effective would you be? Uh, there needs to be a repetition. That is how humans were designed. We need repetition. We need positive reinforcement. We need negative reinforcement. 
Jake. Um, one thing that I <clears throat> that I see in this, it says train up a child in the way that they should go. Um, the reasoning behind why you're doing it. There's a reasoning. The the way is the reasoning behind behind why you're teaching your child this or that. It's it's funny that you brought that up because. <laughs> but that's what I got from it. It's just a, there's, there's a reason. There's a reason behind which direction you're taking your kid. And a good reason. Mm -hmm. uh, a positive reason. There are rewards to that, um, that commandment of which you are being invited to do. But the one thing that really hit me kind of from a, a tangent or, or maybe uh, slightly uh, subliminal, I don't know if that's the word, and that is the second part of the verse where it says, where'd it go? go there. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, he, he or she will not depart from it. That tells me it is possible. I think that's very powerful. Because it is so frustrating to be a parent and to think, <laughs> is it possible for this child to walk in the way and stay in the way? Because really, from a statistical standpoint, the odds are so highly stacked against you, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, there are a lot more influences to uh, steer your child away from the Lord than there are towards the Lord. That's just the reality of the world that we live in. Yes, yes. <clears throat> the, when he is old, he will not depart from it. I cling to that portion of the verse. Because, you know, there is a time, this middle of, a time of their lives where so many things hit them and they're out there uh, starting their lives and whatever. And a lot of things happen to them. A lot of things influence them and they take off in so many different directions. And, but you know, when they come home and visit, you can see, oh, no, they still know. They still know they're acting like this and doing this, but they still know. It's, I take comfort in that because it's when they are old. It's like it's always there with them. It is always there with them. Right. And when the trials and the errors and the things that plague them come, that's where they're going to turn to because it's in them. Right. It, you, you remind me of the, the prodigal son. That's right. a great right. example. Um, it is. It is really. Uh, if, if you're going to be honest with yourself, your child will have, uh, will make bad decisions. Uh, that may take them away from the Lord's church. Hopefully, for a shorter term than long. Hopefully, not at all. Uh, but that's a reality. Without the training that you can give them at the earliest stage, what is the likelihood for them returning? Mm -hmm. So. It's, it's a lifelong commitment. Uh, it is interesting that they use the word old here. Uh, it doesn't say 25 years old. It doesn't say 50 years old or 80 years old. But another thing that we can get from that word old is what does the training that you provide your child do for their children? This is a generational approach. It is a, a domino effect in the most positive of ways. Your training is going to have a result 100 years from now, 200 years from now. How well you train your child could be a 1,000 years. The reason why you are sitting here today, and I am as well, is because someone 2,000 years ago made a decision of which to train up their children or influence other families of which resulted in us being here today. I'm grateful for those people. Um, so let's think long term as well. Um, oh, I already did that. Sorry, hit the wrong button. So where do we start? So uh, we talked about working backwards, starting at the end. What does that concept mean? To me, that means that you need to model what you want your children to be. So they have a structure that shows them where they need to get to. So you need to be strong enough in your faith that you are always looking to God for direction, no matter what comes. And so if you're modeling that to your children, 
then they know whether they fall away at some point or not, that ultimately God is always there for them. He may be the only one who is. Wow. And if you are strong enough in your faith and you believe that, and you always model that to your children, then they will too. Wow, what a great way to, to describe that. Uh, any other thoughts? I like the word model. You know, uh, it is something that's used a lot in today. What's your business model? You know, what, what is your, uh, even when you uh, look at uh, certain industries like uh, architecture, they will actually build a model. And part of the reason for that is so you can, as you said, Angel, visualize the end result. And I think that is, is so valuable. And something that perhaps maybe we need to stress more in the church. And we're going to get into more detail with that. If not today, we'll certainly go next week. Um, can, I, can I add yeah, something? Yeah, absolutely. I think where we start is with ourselves. What, what she says, model. What scares me, I, I taught for a long time. <laughs> and, and when you had the kids you would see, when you met your parents, the parents, you automatically, well now that explains a lot about them. <laughs> and, and that's kind of scary because your kids pick up on all the stuff that you, all your bad habits. Uh, just think about if, you, if your wife do, knows your parents, how she might say, you're just like your dad, yeah. you know? And we do. That may not always be a comfort. <laughs> in my house it's probably not, but, uh, <laughs> You know, it's, it's bad habits. But where do we start is where we're at. Because if, if you want your kids to be churchgoers, then you've got to be one. If you're just an occasional, well, that's what they're going to be because it's not that important to you. Yeah. So what's important to you will be important to your kids. So. Oh, absolutely. Um, and like they say, uh, actions speak louder than words. Mm -hmm. You know, are, are you walking the walk of which they will aspire to walk themselves? I was with, uh, it, that brought up a memory of um, a dinner, several families were meeting after church and this discussion of child rearing came up and uh, laughingly this one dad said, um, I, don't, I can't remember the exact words, but he was laughing and said, well, uh, I feel good about my kids just as long as they don't uh, turn out like me. <laughs> Essentially was what he was saying. Or if they're not as bad as what I got away with, then I'm feeling pretty good about myself as a parent. Well, everybody laughed, um, but on the inside, I kind of felt, I felt a pain in my heart because yes, we want to be that model, but are we really the, the model? Isn't Jesus the, the model of which we should steer? I don't want my, my kids to grow up with my faults as well. Um, Yes, I want to be the kind of dad of which they want to aspire to be a parent like. And I'm, I think your, your comments are right on target. Um, if we're going to be effective in that, uh, in that endeavor as parents, then we absolutely have to walk the walk. And I believe even after the kids leave for college or leave home, are you still attending church services? Because they're gonna know, you know, how active are you in the church? Because now they are seeing and watching you in a different perspective. Yes. Um, I, I talked to my Kayla yesterday. Yeah. And like she she rarely calls home. Like she's you know she's up in Kentucky now. And um, she said, well, what are you doing? I, I, I told her that um, I had to to uh, put put a, a meeting off, and she goes, well, why? I said, because I'm going to church. Oh. And she said, well, why are you going to church? And I said, because I want to. Yeah. And it's end of, end of conversation. She started, you know, talking about something else. But, um, yeah, you're right. When they, get, when they get to college and beyond, they still want to know that you're, what you're doing. And if you're going to church, why is it important? And you're, you're, you, you, you provided a lesson to her, even though it may not have been packaged like that. Uh, you are establishing a commitment to your faith, and, and they hear that. They may not necessarily acknowledge that at first, but that's so important. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I love cars. 
Which car is that? Corvette. That is the brand. Have you got one? Because <laughs> <laughs> you sound like a black like I, I have a 2002 Camry. <laughs> I have always loved Corvettes, and what's interesting to me, and I've always loved cars and sports cars especially, but I, there's something that excites me about a concept drawing. Uh, now, not always do the actual cars look like the drawing, but it's a place to start. And it's, it's really kind of exciting to see uh, what's coming next. And uh, this is the, what's called the C8 Corvette. Now, it's a little bit different than that. This is what the C8 looks like. Now, if, if you've uh, been monitoring car uh, jargon over the last couple of years, or maybe even not, maybe you're just a layperson when it comes to sports cars, there are certain distinct things that are special about the C8 Corvette. What are they? Mid-engine. Mid-engine. There's never been a Corvette where the engine is in the middle or right behind the, the seat. Mid-engine Corvette. That's groundbreaking. There's, I don't know if there's that many U.S. cars, period, with mid-engine. This was groundbreaking stuff. Not from a history of automotive standpoint, because... Uh, Ferraris and Lamborghinis have been doing that for decades, but for the United States to do that, that was a big leap. Any other thoughts on it? You know, the... Electric. Electric? I don't, do they have an electric Corvette version yet? No, uh, there's, there's all kind I mean, in generality, uh, genera uh, in some the uh, the entire car was made from scratch. That, that's essentially a new concept for the United States because we're always tweaking what happened last mm -hmm. model. And yet, uh, the, the people at Chevrolet said, you know what, we need a game changer. And we are going to start with a clean piece of paper. And we are going to build this car from the ground up. And, and a lot of sports car enthusiasts will tell you it is by far the best performing car for the dollar. For 60 grand, you could have one of these. Um, that is unheard of when you compare it to a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or, or one of those you know, McLaren type cars. So, a uh, very, very successful program. So, if that was the C8, what is this? Close. It is a convertible. <laughs> it is, in a way, a C8, but it's not just a C8. Well, have you heard about this car? I don't, I don't even know if they're on the road yet. This is the Z06 ooh, C8. Okay, so he knows. Ooh. No, I just. <laughs> he said a lot of letters. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, it must be better if it's got an extra. Right, it's got way more letters to the front, so that sounds. So what's 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 special about the Z? The uh, Z06. Pardon? Horsepower. Horsepower. Do you know how much more horsepower? Uh, I forget. That's okay. Yeah, so a normal, a normal Corvette will have around 490 horsepower. That's wow. double what most cars have. The Z06 has 670 horsepower, which is like triple what most cars have. Like two Enormously fast. <laughs> now, is there anywhere in the United States that you can drive fast yeah. enough? <laughs> <laughs> Montana. People just want to know that they can. Yeah. Say what? Montana. Montana? Yeah, there's, there's, there's a couple, couple interstates with no speed limit. In, in Montana. Texas, I think, had one. But if you don't live in that area, <laughs> but just knowing that you could go 220 miles an hour, that's important to people for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, unless the cops have a car. Right, unless the cops In Dubai, they actually drive, the, the police drive Lamborghinis. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you had a C8, then you had a convertible C8, then you had the Z51, which I had driven a Z51 on a track, and they are so fast. Amazing car. Um, 
it, it was a thrill to drive. Then you've got the Z06, then you have the convertible Z06. So where am I going with this? There is a process of continuous improvement. You started with a concept, you actually build a prototype, then you build the car, and then you continually, from that point forward, always improve it. If whatever car, even the Camry, next year you have an expectation that it will be better than this year's Camry. Would we approach our parenting skills any differently? Would, would we envision our child to behave any differently? Do we not have uh, a, a plan or an expectation of which, or, or don't we want the end result of that 25-year-old Christian adult to be one that is, is taking on the personal responsibility of, continue, of their own continuous improvement? We always want to be learning. We always want to be building on skills. I think if you know that at the earliest of age, I am going to steer and train this child so that they will take ownership with a, a, uh, a motivation to always stretch and, and build and grow and uh, imagine the great things that will happen as a result of their newly acquired skills. So uh, it was a joke in our family. I hope it wasn't taken the wrong way. I don't think it was. But my girls were so proud of their good grades. And maybe yours will come to you and say, or did come to you and say, I got an A on my test. And I'd say, well, well what was your grade? It was 92. I say, great job. Do better next time. <laughs> and they're like, oh, dad. And then they would come back and say, you know, Dad, I got 110 on my test. And I was like, how'd you do that? Well, we had extra credit. And I said, great job. <laughs> do better next time. <laughs> and they look at me and like, there's no way I could have done better. <laughs> so then I got to think of something. <laughs> and I said, next time, do it faster. <laughs> got to come up with something. But I was trying to instill in my, my children's mind, I can do better next time, I can do better next time. What might I have done differently if I had studied differently, if I had spent just a little more time on this topic instead of that topic? Um, it can become a part of who they are, and I think that's, there's some value to that. Now, let's talk about obstacles. Anybody do a mud run or obstacle course? Who doesn't love ropes course? Have you done a mud run, Michelle? Mm -hmm. It's really. Mm -hmm. You need to do it. <laughs> you did it too? Oh, I, I tell you. Uh, she knew she who did. not to ask. <laughs> she knew exactly who not to ask. <laughs> that actually looks like you, Derek. I thought it might be good. I said I built the signs. There you go. I like to, you know, they have a lot of cars with heated seats, but this yeah, is kind of taking it yeah. to the next level. I did one that was the obstacles and stuff, but they also had zombies. Oh, zombies. Oh, so you those. had three flags, like flag football. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that's funny. If zombies got your all three of your flags, then, then you, you died. Did you become a zombie? I did. <laughs> no, 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 I just died. Oh, you just died. Oh. Um, <laughs> You know, it's one thing to run. I've done a 10K. I did the Peace Street Road Race once, and that, that's enough for me. <laughs> but to do an obstacle course, that's, that's a multiple layer difficulty. Mm -hmm. uh, to have that endurance and not injure yourself, uh, and yet you are being tested in, in so many ways other than just putting one foot in front of the other. Um, I think it's important to look at obstacles before you start a journey, before you start a project. Um, I'm going to talk about it a little bit now, and I think you know we have some great discussion opportunities with this topic. But once we finish, we're going to go into the design phase. But I think the the thought of obstacles should be carried along the way for a couple of reasons. Um, should the reality of obstacles prevent us? from having and raising children? No. No. I would say, for some people, maybe yes. <laughs> or, there are some people who are not ready to be parents. Um, 
There are teenagers who are becoming parents. They're not ready to be parents. Uh, they don't consider the obstacles. Um, so perhaps maybe they can be ready, but are not just yet. Um, but I do think it's important that when you do bring a new life into the world, the reality is it will not be easy. You will be tested as a person like you have never been tested before. The question is, are you ready? Some people might say, well, if, you, if, if you're ready to have children, well then, or if you're waiting to be ready to have children, then you will never have children. <laughs> because you might just talk yourself out of the fact that uh, it's too hard. Uh, but that's, that's not the case. Um, so I think part of the concept of obstacles is preparation. Knowing that they're going to be there. Um, what's kind of interesting is we all know peer pressure is going to be something they're going to be faced with. Perhaps uh, time management is going to be. Maybe they're uh, being uh, diverted. Uh, instead of schoolwork, they're, they're playing video games. <coughs> These are all obstacles that we as parents will have to face. But another reality is there are obstacles for your children of which have not been invented yet. Isn't that kind of a mind-blowing concept? My parents didn't raise me with the fear of the internet. Because <laughs> it wasn't invented yet. Maybe I've just dated myself a little bit. Too. <laughs> but there's something. Say, say that? What? I said we're all there with you. Oh, okay. <laughs> So for the next generation, there's something coming. Something else, yeah. And we don't know how to prepare for it. But have we developed the skills ourselves to adapt or learn and, and uh, analyze and make decisions and seek that wisdom from God that we've been talking about to help us to recognize that it is an obstacle and to seek out opportunities of which we can uh, tackle those or eliminate uh, those those obstacles that are going to happen. What about the obstacle? What verse in the Bible does this picture remind you of? Second Peter. The devil. The devil. You remember what verse? Second Peter. Okay. Say it again. So the devil walks about as a roaring lion. Remember we had a whole class on Satan for the longest time? Um, do anybody remember the verse? Because I brought it up like kind of every week. <laughs> First Peter 5, 8, which says, Be sober, be vigilant, for the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Devour is not. If there's one fear I have in the, in the world, it's being eaten by another animal. You know, I watched enough Shark Week to know <laughs> that that's not a pleasant experience. And people don't survive it too often or lose an arm or a leg. Um, the idea of being uh, like Daniel in the lion's den, that's scary to me. Because I don't know how, how, do you, how do you fight those kinds of things. Um, so 1 Peter 5 8, I think, is a great verse of which we need to be uh, aware of and inspired by. Um, just uh, for the sake of brainstorming, what might be some obstacles we would expect our children to face when it comes to developing their future Christian self? Their exposure to so much. Um, I was 13 when we, were, when we finally had cable in my small town in North Carolina. I had three channels and they went off at 11. Um, anything I was exposed to was gonna be within the range of me riding my bicycle. If I couldn't get past, you know, that was it. And yeah. it was pretty simple. But now they, they, they're a click away from so much exposure for so much negativity and for, so I guess, really just false ways of life. And when they see these people with all the money and all the jewelry and, and, and these people are supposed to be um, I guess the what is the social Your media mouth. influencers yeah. or whatnot? Yeah. They really they, they start to buy into that. It, it, it impacts. Them. Yeah. So so much exposure. So media exposure, uh, 
What else? Peers. Peer pressure. Peer pressure. That hadn't gone away. In fact, it's probably even worse. You know, you mentioned media, social media. Uh, I think peer pressure has been taken up a couple notches beyond what we did. Uh, because now everything's electronic. You can gossip on uh, about someone in a millisecond and reach 100, 200 people instantly. Where it used to be, you have to pass. You used to have to pass notes behind the teacher's back. <laughs> you know, uh, that's pretty snail mail compared. Who else? You have a comment? Um, if if your child goes to public school, you've got the state curriculum. You've got to worry about. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah. In yeah. some places. So you're going to have to recognize your child will be taught uh, topics on contrary, blatant contrary to the Bible. We're going to bring up evolution in the future. Uh, it's, it's, it's a bigger problem than we realize. Did you have to? Uh, sending them to college was probably, they were great until smart kids. Oh, so excited. They're smart enough to go to college. They got accepted. They're going to go. What a horrible mistake. <laughs> <laughs> It's a whole bunch of kids thrown in the same environment together, free for the first time from having to check in with somebody and uh, the things that they are exposed to, the people that they're exposed to, the thing, it's, it's shocking and, and amazing and they come home scary. a little chunky, it's scary. Yeah. It's scary. I see that uh, the graduation from high school to college or high school to career is being like uh, standing on the edge of a cliff. You could have a great view of what's in front of you or you could plummet. And so many kids are either being pushed over the edge or leaping over the edge. You know, I'm saying figuratively from a spiritual standpoint. So what does that tell us? It said a couple of verses ago, train up a child in the way that they should go. So might we put more emphasis on, okay, child, you're about to go to college. Do they even recognize the obstacles that they're about to experience? Or have we as parents wised them up to the point where they don't go there? Because they don't, they don't see that complete freedom as an obstacle, but it is. And I think part of the opportunity as a parent or challenge as a parent might be, do they understand the consequences? Because so many times they don't. And perhaps we need to do a better job of helping them understand the consequences. They, they're so sick and tired of mom and dad telling them what to do. Can't wait to get away. Can't wait to get to college. Wow, reality hits them in the face, and maybe they are so attracted by uh, the fun and the perception of the freedom and the fun and the. I've been waiting for this moment <laughs> my whole life because nobody's telling me. You know, I'm in the driver's seat. That's what, that's how they perceive themselves. But uh, might they act differently if they have full understanding of just? Uh, and the, the, the actions that they take, of course, are going to have consequences. But for me, it's not, it's not necessarily the actions. The actions are going to learn very hard life lessons from. They're going to learn those uh, repercussions, and they're going to have to deal with it. And that is a growing thing. You want them to kind of have those things. It's more of the mindset change that college affords them that worries me more than the Oh, really? That's what happened to you? Yeah. And what happened? Yeah. You had to do that? Uh, yeah. That's what happens when you do this. And they learn that. But it's more of the it may not be a, It may not be a slap on the wrist. It may be devastating. Right. Mm -hmm. I am so tired. It saddens me. But I'm tired and sick of hearing these news reports of these fraternity brothers that die on initiation night because they got so drunk that they died or fell downstairs or whatever prank was played upon them resulted in their death. There's a, a, a band member who got, they had to run the gauntlet within the truck and every time they had to run to the back of the bus, 
the rest of the band members would punch him in the stomach. Poor guy died. So the consequences are devastating. And he, he didn't just end his own life, or, or resulted, I'm sure, none of those uh, young men that I'm thinking of wanted to die, but the end result was that they did, and that those consequences weren't just felt by him. The whole family was affected. Also the whole school was affected. When they think they're uh, invincible. They think nothing can happen to them. They think they're yeah, and isn't that because mom and dad kind of kept them so safe that they did not feel any potential harm? You know, and, and I'm not saying we shouldn't keep our kids safe. We should. You know, that's our job. But at the same time, uh, there, maybe there's a transition that needs to take place so that they can. And I'll tell you, my kids will tell you when we travel, especially overseas, I am so paranoid about pickpockets. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me ill. Are you the same way? Same way. I've got carabiners and I've got straps and duct tape and names. <laughs> Just tape. as a joke, they gave me a backpack that has Brian written on it. So, you know. Um, but who would stop, you know, uh, just because my name was on it, you know? They would take it anyways. But I make everybody else miserable worrying about that. Don't do that. But I have, as best as I know, I haven't been stolen from. So I kind of feel like it was a healthy paranoia, yeah. but I think part of what you're describing is, is an opportunity, you know. Hey, here's an area of which maybe we should focus a little bit more. Maybe that's something our youth director needs to focus on, is preparing these kids to step out the door towards that freedom that they are so anxious to get towards. Yeah, well, I think it's such a fine line. I mean, you want to prepare your, your, your kids for the real world but you also want to protect them as much as you can. But sometimes, like you said, it can be an obstacle, you know? Because when they get up there, when they get out into the new world, in the, in the real world, when they're out of college, you have so many different things that are thrown at you that sometimes you're just not fully prepared for. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I was talking to Alan Stewart, who, and we'll, we'll wrap this up. I know everybody else is leaving. Um, what do you think about a soldier? A soldier goes through all kinds of serious, intense, training. And you might even say they are prepared for anything. Well, you can't be prepared for everything. But the concept is kind of where we need to be, is it not that you are training a soldier to be able to understand and recognize and adapt and decide with the information that I have right here and now, what is the best move? What is the action required of us as a team to complete this mission successfully. So that, I think, is part of the training of a child. They have to be capable for anything. I mean, and God tells us that that is possible. So, hey, that's, that's kind of exciting. But how many parent, parents of the world take that approach? Uh, we could go on for, for hours, I think. So um, I do have a little bit of homework in that be thinking about next week and what verses did your parents really emphasize upon you as a young person? Did they have any sage wisdom or verses that they kept reinforcing with you? What have you used with your own children? Perhaps something different? Um, and maybe what as a church we should do? Because, you know, they... I, I don't really like the, the, the phrase, it takes a village, <laughs> because I think Hillary Clinton wrote a book that's entitled The Tech Division. But, uh, and it may be a great book, I, I haven't read it. But uh, the concept is, is correct. As a church, and I think that's one reason why God gave us the church, is because we can collectively train our children to withstand anything that Satan can send at them. Maybe not every single time, they're gonna make mistakes. But the resiliency, the thankfulness for forgiveness, that is possible. So let's let's strive for that. Thanks for your comments. Pass in your cards if you haven't already.